Okay, so as far as the big changes to the conservation title, there has been a decrease in funding. Um, we're looking at a decrease in a total of $6.1 billion with sequestration. Um, so it's funded at just under $58 billion total. In general, the um, conservation title has been more streamlined. Um, previously, there were 23 conservation programs authorized and funded uh, through the conservation title, and now there's only 13. Mainly, um, the large existing programs, such as, such as the Conservation Reserve Program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and the Conservation Stewardship Program, those were all reauthorized, and small, similar programs were rolled into those larger ones. Furthermore, there are two new programs that were previously seven separate programs. So um, I'll talk a little bit more detail about those two new programs later. And then um, the other big change is that there's a requirement for conservation compliance to any farmers who are going to use crop insurance and have some of their subsidies um, receive federal subsidies from their government for their crop insurance. Um, so this is nothing new as far as com complying with highly erodible land regulations and wetland provisions. That's nothing new. Farmers needed to be in compliance with that to receive direct or counter cyclical payments. But it's new in that it's required for crop insurance. So. Farmers that receive crop insurance need to make sure that they're in compliance with um, the conservation rules in terms of highly erodible lands and wetlands, um, otherwise they will not receive the federal subsidized portion of their crop insurance. The other big change is um, there's been an addition to the eligible farmers. Uh, and it's a veteran farmer or rancher is now eligible for um, some, some improved access to conservation programs or a higher percentage of cost share, and I'll talk to you a little bit about those in some following slides. But a veteran farmer or rancher is a farmer or rancher who has served in any of the armed forces listed there on the right, and they have to be a pretty new farmer as well. So they haven't operated a farm or ranch in the past or are new to farming, they haven't farmed or ranched for more than 10 years. I wanted to show you uh, some of the real repealed programs, and you can see several of these listed here. And of course, I'll talk to you in about um, a little more detail about some of these programs have been repealed, but they've been absorbed into some of the bigger conservation programs. So just a quick snapshot of programs that are no longer in existence. And I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about the big changes to um, the programs that we are pretty familiar with. So the Conservation Reserve Program is a land retirement program that has been around um, the longest of all the conserva conservation programs. Uh, it provides annual rental payments to producers to replace crops on highly erodible and environmentally sensitive lands and you establish long-term resource-conserving plantings, um, native grasses, longleaf pines, all of that. And that's a program, again, like I said, we're pretty familiar with. As far as the big changes to CRP, there's a big reduction in acres. And uh, you can see that currently we have 32 million acres in CRP. And by 2018, the end of this Farm Bill, we're looking at having only 24 million acres in the program. That reduction in acres is mostly going to occur through the retirement of contracts and, um, and those contracts not being renewed. So you saw on the repealed program slide that the Grasslands Reserve Program is repealed. Grasslands can now be added to eligible lands in the Conservation Reserve Program. Um, and things that ha were allowed on grasslands can occur under CF CRP, such as grazing and harvesting, as well as fire suppression. Another thing was established in terms of flexible contract lengths. 
that go beyond the 10 to 15 year typical contract of CRP. And that's for land that's devoted to hardwood trees, shelter belts and windbreaks, as well as wildlife corridors. Additionally, they're allowing emergency harvesting or grazing on um, lands without a reduction in rental rate, as long as an emergency has been declared by the secretary. Beginning farmers can graze without a reduced rental rate, so they're trying to um, provide extra incentives for beginning farmers. And some permitted activities um, can be allowed as long as there's a conservation plan in place at a reduction of the rental rate, no more than 25% um, of harvesting, grazing, and things such as wind turbines. Another thing is that land improvements can be installed a year before the CRP uh, contract expires for a reduced rental rate, and then that land cannot be re-enrolled in CRP for five years. To support forestry and the pines and, and things that, like that that are put on CRP, there's incentive payments for thinning trees and maintaining shrubs um, that are no more than 150% of the cost of thinning the trees and shrubs. If, of course, that those activities are capped at $10 million over the life of the farm bill. Um, they want to make sure that rental rates are accurate, and so they're requiring annual surveys of that. And then another thing that's new is that producers who have had a CRP contract in place for over five years can terminate their contract early in fiscal uh, year 2015 without a penalty, and, um, and that's allowed on all acres unless they're in the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. And then landowners can enroll in uh, the CSP program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, which I'll talk about next, and conduct activities required under CSP in the final year of the Conservation Reserve Program contract. And then here's where a veteran farmer or rancher is added to the program. The acres can be transferred out of a CRP um, program to a beginning farmer or a veteran farmer or rancher, or a socially disadvantaged farmer or rancher um, to return land into production if the contract is owned by a retiring farmer and he's transferring those acres to that special class of farmer. Um, so the person can still receive their final year, the retiring farmer can still receive their final year of payment and um, the veteran farmer or rancher or beginning and socially disadvantaged farmer can go ahead and put that land into production. So those are um, all the big major changes to the Conservation Reserve Program. Now we'll talk about the Conservation Stewardship Program. And this is a working lands program. It originally started out as a Conservation Security Program, and then the last Farm Bill, 2008, was converted to the Conservation Stewardship Program. And it pays producers, um, gives financial and technical assistance to producers to continue doing conservation on their farms and to enhance the conservation activities that they're doing on their farms. And it's on private working lands as well as non-industrial private forest lands. CSP is also seeing a cut. Um, Currently, it's funded at over $12 million, and it's going to be cut to, or excuse me, 12 million acres, and it's going to be cut to 10 million acres. Um, but they still want to have the target average payment for the program to be $18 an acre. Now, that's an average payment. So typically, the average payment for non-industrial private forest land is $8 to $10 an acre. So lands that are in production and agricultural production tend to be a little bit higher than that, um, but the target for the program is $18 per acre. The big change in terms of eligible lands is that there's no longer a limit to uh, non-industrial private forest land that's enrolled in the program. Previously, it was limited to 10% of total acres each year, but that cap no longer exists. 
They've increased the entry requirement, so upon application, a producer or landowner needs to address two resource concerns and meet or exceed the threshold for at least one additional priority resource concern. Um, and also contract renewals need to meet the threshold for two additional priority resource concerns or exceed the threshold for two existing resource concerns. And if you want more details about the types of enhancements and resource concerns, um, the NRCS is a great contact for that, um, for those specific types of questions. The USDA also has to identify five priority resource concerns for the state. Um, previously, it was three to five, but now they need to identify five or more. So, in addition to increasing the entry requirements and thresholds that need to be met during the contract, now there's more priority resource concerns that can be addressed. So, um, that's a good thing. And there's a payment limit of 200000 in aggregate on all conservation stewardship program contracts during the life of this farm bill. And um, I was asked at a previous meeting if that means that if I maxed out during the 08 Farm Bill, can I participate in this one? And as far as I interpret it, yes. So this is a new maximum payment limit for this Farm Bill specifically. All right, now we'll move into some of the big changes in the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And this is one of the bigger um, conservation programs, and it has also been around for a long time, longer than CSP, but not quite as long as the CRP. The EQIP program provides financial and technical assistance to uh, farmers and forest owners through contracts that are up to 10 years in length to improve soil, air, water, plant, wildlife, and um, related resources on ag and non-industrial non private forest land. So the big change as far as the priorities of EQIP, um, you can see listed there are the four big priorities of EQIP. Um, you can see number three I highlighted to improve wildlife habitat. So you, you may recall that the Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program was a repealed program. That program has basically been um, absorbed by EQIP. So there's a higher priority on wildlife habitat in EQIP now. Um, contract lakes are up to 10 years. Previously, there was a minimum requirement of a contract of being one year, but now there's no minimum requirement on contract length. And they've added a veteran farmer or rancher to the list of um, producers who are eligible for cost share rates up to 90% and advance payment of 50%. So say it's a veteran farmer or rancher who wants to install a heavy use area for their livestock. Um, for their watering area or they want to install some fencing, but they can't afford to put up the upfront cost to pay for that, they can get 50% of their payments in advance to help them pay for that. The EQIP program has, can, has been for several years um, majority focused on livestock producers and that requirement is extended, that 60% of funds go to livestock producers. Um, and then I mentioned about the Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program. There's a provision specifically that says at least 5% of the funds um, to payments need to go to benefiting wildlife habitat. So that actually is an increase to the Wildlife Habit to the WIP program, um, which was previously funded, I think, like at 250,000 set per year. So. This is an increase uh, for wildlife habitat, so um, people that are advocates for wildlife habitat are, we're really happy to see that in the program. Uh, EQIP payment limits are now increased from 300000 to 450000 uh, in aggregate over the life of this farm bill. And there you can see on the right the mandatory funding levels. Um, and a note about mandatory funding versus authorized funding, mandatory funding has to be um, utilized, but authorized funding, say we can authorize it, but if the budget is not available for the program, then the program may not get funded. So EQIP is a mandatory funded program. 
Now I want to talk to you briefly about um, the two new programs that I mentioned, Absorb 7 smaller programs, and this one absorbs three programs. This is the Agricultural Conservation Enhancement Program. It um, combines the purposes of the Wetlands Reserve Program, Farmland Protection Program, and the Grasslands Reserve Program, and um, basically establishes two types of easements, a wetlands easement um, to protect and restore wetlands, and an agricultural land easement to keep agricultural land in agricultural production. The other brand new program is the Re Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And let me pull that slide up on my other computer. This combines the Ag Water Enhancement Program, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Program, and the Conservation Cooperative Partnership Initiative, and the Great Lakes Basin Program into a new competitive grant program for improving soil quality, water quality, or wildlife habitat in specific areas or regions. And it basically enables the ability for um, local groups uh, and entities to partner with producers in helping them install um, conservation practices, apply for conservation programs, all of that. So it helps local entities partner with USDA and with farmers in helping in enhance conservation programs. So let me show you real quick um, a few things about it. Uh, it is mandatory in terms of its funding and 25% um, of funds are for state competitions, 40% for national competitions, and 35% for critical conservation areas. Uh, an example might be the Chesapeake Bay area, um, and so on. So funds for the Regional Conservation Partnership Program actually come from uh, other programs such as the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, EQIP, um, Conservation Stewardship Program, all of those. Seven percent of covered program funds go to paying for the uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program. But if those funds are not utilized, then they go back to the covered program funds um, if they're not utilized by April 1st. Just a real quick note about the other, some other conservation programs. There are six smaller conservation programs with authorized funding. Some of them have mandatory, and you can see that noted there. Um, but these are the six other programs that are funded through the um, conservation title. And that actually ends my presentation.